King of Fighters, Metal Slug, Fatal Fury, Samurai Showdown. These are the iconic names you'll hear time and again when discussing SNK Online. But what seldom gets the spotlight is SNK's pretty big catalogue of obscure titles, one of which will be the subject of the next instalment in this video series. Welcome to What the F*** is Akari Warriors? It's kind of an awkward name actually. It feels like it should be What the Fuck Are the Akari Warriors? Welcome to What the Fuck Are the Akari Warriors? <laughs> Ralph Jones and Clark Steele. When it comes to SNK characters, you don't get much more iconic than these two. Members of Commander Hyden's Akari troop, they've enjoyed the spotlight across two of SNK's biggest franchises, most notably their appearances in King of Fighters. But where did they come from? Well, just like Athena, they were plucked out of an old arcade series to build up KOF 94's roster. Yeah, those two generic Rambo dudes I mentioned in the Psycho Soldier video actually were redesigned into interesting and iconic characters. Shoutouts to the two commenters who not only had the joke fly over their heads, but also misspelled Ralph's name the same way. Yeah, before Ralph was a beer guzzling, exploity punch man colonel, and before Clark wore sunglasses, they were both just two Stallone lookalikes hailing from an arcade game called Ikari Warriors. In fact, Sylvester Stallone actually once owned an Ikari Warriors cabinet. See, the game was actually conceived as a direct adaptation of the second Rambo movie, and it almost happened, but SNK had already revealed the game with the Ikari name at an American arcade expo, so they felt it was too late and didn't end up acquiring the license. You gotta love Japanese arcade developers fumbling western licenses in the 80s. Gave us Ralph and Clark, gave us fucking Mario and Donkey Kong. In today's world, you might only know two things about this game. One, that it's really hard, and two, that it's really shit. But back in the day, this game was actually pretty damn popular. It was Japan's second highest grossing cabinet in 1986, and ranked among America's top five arcade games two years in a row. In 1986, it was even the third highest grossing arcade title in London! Yeah, this thing was a nice little earner for SNK and helped them carve out a name for themselves in Western territories. And look how good that ended up. So I mean, shit, with those kind of accolades, I should be in for a good time, right? Let's boot up Akari Warriors and see what we're working with here. Holy shit, look at that aspect ratio. Whoa, man, you can play it on your phone! So the story of the game is that you're infiltrating an enemy base to rescue your commander who has been kidnapped. The game starts with your plane being shut down and you begin your one-man war as Ralph Jones. And Clark Steele, if you have a second player. But who the hell am I gonna get to play this shit with me? Funnily enough, the enemy soldiers actually look more like Clark than Clark himself in this game. Seems like Nests cloned him 9,000 fucking times before moving on to Japanese teenage boys. Well, I say Ralph and Clark, but in the American translations, they're actually called Paul and Vince. I guess American localizers just really do not think that Ralph is a cool enough name. The gameplay is very simple. You move around, fire your gun, and throw grenades. It's pretty much a homage. It's a Capcom's arcade game Commando, although Akari Warriors does add a bit of extra depth with its rotary joystick that allows the player to aim their gun independently from the direction their character is moving. This is a gimmick lifted from SNK's earlier arcade shooter called TNK3, which is actually the first appearance of Ralph Jones, but I'm not covering that game in this video, I only have so much patience for this shit. Honestly, I went in expecting the most clunky, out-of-date arcade run and gun you could possibly think of, but it actually plays better than I expected. Although that's probably because the version of this game that I'm most familiar with is the shitty NES port that looks stiff as shit. As a matter of fact, I found myself having spurts of almost fun when the game decided to give me a reprieve from the constant bollocks flying at me from every direction. It's a shame then that those small moments where the game is kind of enjoyable makes up maybe 4% of the experience, with the rest being a completely overstimulating clusterfuck. Seriously, it feels like a precursor to fucking Toho at times except with Rambo. The game can go from 0 to 60 in a second. One moment you feel like you're on top of stuff, and then suddenly you're getting mating pressed between six enemies with your only escape route being landing zones for missiles that just got launched up your arsehole. Now, evading all this crap the game throws at you could be manageable, if not for how explosions work. A lot of stuff triggers explosions. Red grenades, enemies blowing up, enemy turrets blowing up, enemy helicopters blowing up, walls blowing up, fucking rocks! And the issue with this is that outside of the initial blast, the explosion will also split off into debris that goes in eight directions, and since one explosion often sets off a chain reaction, most of the time you simply have no way to evade them unless you have perfect split-second decision-making and insanely good spacing. Ralph just isn't fast enough to move out of the way every time, 
Especially not in water where you can also get fucked by landmines that literally move faster than you do. And don't even get me started on these forsaken fucking helicopters which spray like a zillion bullets at you and the angle at which you have to throw your grenades at them to take them down is so precise and awkward that I usually just try and run past them which either results in me being clipped by one of its stray bullets, or running straight into the loving arms of an enemy soldier. Christ, he didn't even shoot me, he just ran into me. Come on Ralph, I thought you could survive nukes, but here you are dying because some cunt pushed you. Just like in Psycho Soldier, your attacks can be upgraded over time, but because of the insane difficulty, you'll seldom ever get to experience that because you lose all your upgrades in a single hit, it's brutal. A real shame because the game would actually be a lot more fun if you just kept your upgrades for the entire quarter. I often just have to hug the bottom of my screen out of fear that a random explosion is going to suddenly happen and steal all my upgrades. And without the upgrades, all it takes to completely stop your forward momentum is two assholes throwing grenades at you atop an unreachable wall. Even something as small as that is basically a checkmate if your weapons are at the lowest level, and they will be, and you just have to damage boost right through it. So I have no idea how they thought any human being would be able to deal with shit like this. Sometimes even the fucking soldiers just kamikaze on you when they get close enough. Yeah, you can ride these tanks which fire these powerful shots and I think are invulnerable to regular enemy fire, but it needs fuel to keep going which you won't always be able to reach in time, and if your fuel depletes, what happens? Tank fucking explodes! Oh, thanks a lot, asshole. And now I can't even escape the explosion in time because this dude has me pinned down. Hell, sometimes even the invincibility you get after losing life screws you over because while you're invulnerable for a few seconds, you also can't stop moving forward and can end up being put into unwinnable situations because of it. Yeah, great, put me onto the tank. At least the game isn't too long. It's basically one huge scrolling level with a couple basic changes in scenery to indicate that you're getting closer to the end. There's also these sort of boss encounters, but to be honest, I cannot detect any difference between these sections and the regular gameplay. The only reason I know they exist is because the music changes and there's usually a new obstacle to take down, like three big tanks for example. As you progress further, the chances of you ever getting one hand back on the steering wheel are completely shot and I pretty much spent the final stretch of this game dying, walking for 0.3 seconds and then dying again. Rinse and repeat. Ooh, a red carpet. Tell me this is the fucking end of it. Oh, the final boss is me after a 12 hour goon sesh. No, but seriously, who the fuck? What the fuck? What is this? Well, in the Japanese version of Hikari Warriors, there's actually a swastika on the carpet of this room, implying that the enemy forces are neo-Nazis. Which leads me to think that this is the decomposed corpse of Adolf Hitler? He's hooked up to these four cannons that shoot shit at you, but he doesn't actually seem to be cognitive. And he just goes down in one measly grenade like everything else, just leaving a mangled carcass on the floor for you to step over. It's actually surprisingly creepy. Or at least it would be, if I was given a single fucking second to contemplate it before getting shot by the endless supply of blue pedophiles. I'm serious, the final boss is dead, I'm mere steps away from the fucking game being over, and I'm still getting pelted in every orifice and constantly needing to butter up the cabinet with more of my coal mine money. Eat shit, Akari Warriors! I promise I beat this game, but on my second playthrough that I recorded, the game booted me back to the fucking beginning for no reason, when I was literally a couple steps away from the final screen. All that happens is that you walk to the end of the hall and rescue your commander who is just standing there. And it begs the question, why couldn't he just eat the occupying force? Look at the size of him, he's an absolute fucking unit! Getting hit by one of the enemy missiles would probably just feel like getting shit on by a bird to him. By the way, his name is Colonel Cook, named after the founder of the company that distributed Akari Warriors in the US. But in the Japanese original, he's called General Kawasaki! Were you expecting Hydern? You were expecting Hydern. Ah, 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 scroll back up, bitch. I know you're about to leave a comment telling me how you already know about General Kawasaki. Cut that shit out. Ugh, Jesus, I can see this game being kind of fun if a couple improvements were made, but even with those adjustments, it's still pretty much inferior to Commando, the game that it's ribbing in the first place. As I previously mentioned, Akari Warriors received an NES port. In fact, it got ported to a ton of shit. Commodore 64, Atari, IBM PC, Commodore 64 again. I think you could even play it on a TI-40 calculator. You know, like one of those Happy Meal Sonic games. Holy shit, it works.
Most of the ports were just lower, well, even lower fidelity versions of their arcade counterpart, but the NES port got some special treatment. In fact, it might even be the more infamous version of the game. It's a hell of a lot longer for one thing, and is split into distinct levels. Very long ones. And of course, it plays like honking shit. Not that I tried. Look, I'm only willing to put myself through so much suffering for you guys. Check out the AVGN for a closer look at the NES port. Or, uh, maybe this guy. Millions of enemies coming at you. Missiles fly at you with no warning. Landmines appear in hard to dodge places. And enemy bunkers that have no pattern of projectiles, which causes you to die for trying to blow them up! Anyway, we still have two more titles to look at. So let's move on. <sighs> Ladies and gentlemen, Ikari Warriors 2. Warriors! Show some guts! You can't escape me! Come get me if you can! <laughs> What the fuck? I think I'm having a bad trip. How- how does this happen? We're in space? Fighting little green homunculi and- and the spiders from Mario 64? First we were Rambo, now we're Ash Williams? Why? How did we get here? And why does the villain sound like that? And why does everything make these strange noises and- Oh fuck. I didn't edit that. That's how it is. I couldn't believe what I was seeing and hearing. So after making sure I wasn't experiencing some sort of sleep paralysis, I looked this game up just to see if it was adapted or retooled from something else a la Doki Doki Panic and no, this is just what they decided to make. In SNK's minds, this was the natural progression from the first game. Oh well, no, fair enough then. I know that I sat there watching First Blood Part 2 thinking, when the hell is he gonna go to space? The arcade version provides absolutely no context for anything, so let's turn to the NES port once again for some clue as to what is happening. You know, I'm starting to think these games are part of a psyop just to fuck with me for having the gall to cover them for a YouTube video. Like, oh, you wanna research us, you dipshit nerd? Here's the slowest moving text score you've ever seen. Fuck you, our main antagonist's name is Zhang Zip. Man, what is bro yapping about? You know what? Doesn't matter. We're in space, we're fighting demon aliens, that's all you really need to know. The gameplay mechanics are more or less the same as the first, but the enemy and weapon selection has been expanded significantly. There's a slew of demonic creatures out to kill you, from the little alien babies, to huge space spiders, to pig soldier things, and these extremely fucking annoying succubuses that swoop around the screen in such a way that if you don't take them out for your initial reaction shot, you can be sure that they're flying straight up your asshole. Oh shit, I already used that phrase in this video. Luckily, there's also a few new weapons you can fight back with. You have the usual gun, of course, with the same red bullet upgrade as in the first game. But now you can acquire a flamethrower, a boomerang, and best of all, a sword. Now we're fucking Conan. And in case you were wondering, you can still shoot with the sword. Eat shit, Squall. Ralph and Clark were rocking the gunblade first. All the new enemies and weapons are cool, but lack of variety isn't really one of the main problems I had with the original Akari Warriors. So does Victory Road, that's what it's called, improve its predecessor's extremely unfair difficulty? Does it fucking look like it? Remember, this is from the mid 80s, a time where video games weren't even close to being considered an art form, and were instead colours and noise designed to suckle your fucking pocket money up. It's the boomer equivalent of watching skibbity toilet videos on an iPad, full fucking volume in a restaurant booth. You know what disturbs me about that shit? The kids watching those videos aren't ever laughing or smiling, or really reacting in any meaningful way. They're always just staring, completely thoughtlessly at the screen, veritably brainwashed by the heedless fucking creators that care not for how they might be affecting an entire generation of children, so long as their pockets get lined. For the first couple minutes of Victory Road, you might be tricked into thinking that the developers are showing a shred of mercy on you. It's fairly manageable for a little while. The game quickly remembers its heritage and becomes Clusterfuck City. It's basically the exact same as the first game, a relentless barrage of shit you just won't be able to react to. And with the enemies having more advanced movement paths, it just exacerbates the problem. And did this game really need enemies coming up from behind you? Was that truly necessary? Yeah, I know they did it in the first game as well, but it's especially obnoxious in this game. Fuck you, I'm Ralph Jones! This is actually working. Oh, fuck. Welcome, warrior, to my home. This is the place of your death. Oh my god, this game's special. 
This game is so special, bro. The game does give you a shred of mercy though, as when you reload after a game over, you're actually given the flamethrower weapon as your default. You know, at least until you take a single cunting hit. So that's nice and all, but the final half of the game is still so brutal that you're just gonna have to say fuck it and damage boost your way forward anyway. And speaking of the second half of the game, boy does Victory Road start to overstay its welcome a bit. It's still short, but they lazily extended it in ways they didn't need to. For example, there are these annoying green tiles that occasionally spawn in and bring you to this red room where you're forced to fight a boss encounter. At first I thought these were mandatory, but quickly realised they're literally just booby traps designed to block the most obvious way forward. Seriously, there is absolutely no point to these. You don't even fight original bosses, just reused ones that you'll come across throughout the game anyway. Or occasionally you'll fight that asshole from the start of the game. I don't have much footage of these since in my recorded playthrough I ended up just avoiding them all. Also, I swear to god they just start copy-pasting shit in the last level. Now, I would say that Victory Road is an improvement on Akari Warriors despite sharing a lot of its flaws. I would say the music is better, or at least more varied. That the different enemies, however annoying, help break up the tedium that Akari 1 suffered from. How the new weapons you can mess around with add replay value. I would say all of that. However, the final boss is racist. Racist against who? It's racist against gamers. It laughs in the face of gamer culture. It's a spit in the face and kicking the balls to every gamer that plays this pile of shit through to the end. I sat here for 20 fucking minutes shooting this forsaken fucking boss over and over and over, dying over and over and over. No indication that I was making any progress. No changing music, no visible battle damage, nothing. Just shoot, die, shoot, die, shoot, die. And let's not forget what you have to hear every time you get a game over. Get ready to hear that every 15 fucking seconds for the next 20 goddamn minutes, bro. And multiple times I looked up if I was doing anything wrong. Nope, I wasn't. My technique might not have been as good as a literal test spot, but there was no strategy I was oblivious to. You are actually, seriously, literally supposed to just sit there and shoot it and die and shoot it and die for 20 minutes of your life that you'll never get back. And what's your reward? Fucking text! You don't even get a new screen like a picture of Ralph giving a thumbs up or sticking his thumb up an alien stain. You just get another goddamn freeze frame with a stupid blurb on it. At least Takeshi's challenge shows you the man's face. I got approximately 20 game overs during the duration of this boss. That is five fucking bucks to see a wall of English text. No wonder that teenagers threw bricks into store windows or drank all their dad's liquor to have fun in the 80s when the alternative was wasting all your money and time on this fucking hog shit. No. Don't play Victory Road. Any possible edge or advantage it might have over the first game is nullified by this abomination of game design. Get this shit off of my PC. <sighs> Jesus. There's still one more game left though. Ikari 3 The Rescue. Will it improve on the formula established by the first two games? Fucking... <laughs> While Ikari 1 and 2 were released within the same year, Ikari 3 came out a couple years later. We can see that all the money from Victory Road's four hour long final boss was put to good use, as the presentation is a significant step up. We even have a little opening cutscene to give us our premise. A presidential candidate's child has been kidnapped by a terrorist group, and instead of sending a full squadron, the US government decides to send two guys. Well, I guess it's still better than one guy from Pennsylvania. We're back to basics in this game. Rambo guy, jungle, private military assholes. They once again look a bit like Clark, starting to think that this was the inspiration for his KOF 99 onwards look. One thing that's been axed are the rotary controls that the first two games had. It plays more like Commando now, which for emulation makes my life a lot easier, but it does remove one of the series' unique attributes. But it's not really a big deal, since the game plays better than its predecessors anyway. Yeah, in a stroke of what I'm gonna call either luck or just magic, Ikari 3 is actually not an insane seizure-inducing ball ache from beginning to end. Thank Allah. Finally! It retains the same basic skeleton as before, but there's definitely more of a focus on hand-to-hand -hand combat in this game. In fact, getting a gun at all is actually pretty rare, which sucks because it's definitely my favourite weapon to use. Mostly because it's broken as shit. But they brought back the limited ammo cap from the first game, so thanks for that. There are only 20 shells per gun, and you can't even drop the bloody thing once they're all spent, you have to get hit by an enemy. The rest of the weapons are nothing special, you can pick up a knife occasionally, which is pretty handy, but you'll drop it if you get hit. And all the other weapons are just more one-use items that you throw at enemies and, of course, cause explosions that you can get hit by. It's not that your basic punches and kicks won't see you through just fine, but the stark lack of weapon variation means this game gets repetitive pretty darn quick. I found myself just mindlessly mashing at certain points with the progression being very slow and stilted. Move, 
stop for 30 seconds to kill enemies, move, stop, move. It gets pretty agonizing at particular points, so that definitely sucks, but honestly, after the raw butt fucking the first two games gave me, I can't really bring myself to come down on it very hard. Ikari 3 never even comes close to getting as bad as the previous games, but it does occasionally throw some bullshit at you. Oh, come on, how am I supposed to react to that? Yeah, okay, I fucking get it, Akari 3. There's also boss encounters again, but they're nothing special. Usually just tanks that you're given a gun right before in order to defeat. Uh, alright, what do I do now? Why is this bloke just hanging out with me? I've got no bullets left, so I can't kill him, and he refuses to attack me, so... I guess we're just stuck in purgatory. Um, I'm starting to run out of time here. Could you hit me? Could you, like, attack me? Or something? Come on, you fucker, hit me. Hit me! Come on, come on, come on. Come on! God, God damn it, what the fuck? What happened there? Well, as I learned later, if you run out of ammo during a boss fight, the game drops in an enemy with another gun for you to collect after the boss damages you. Only in this case, I defeated the boss at the same time as I ran out of ammo, and since the game doesn't move forward until you've killed every enemy, I got softlocked because of this invincible dickhead. Anyway, after a bit, you get to a point where Ralph says, Look, there's the child. Oh shit, Ro! I'll save you! Oh, Jesus Christ, just let me win you, asshole. Finally! We fucking did it! You know, I was starting to feel like this series would never... Oh oh <sighs> Fuck me, I thought I was free. Seriously? Why does he wade through the water like Amy Rose? Alright, I got the child again. Can we be done with it now? Oh fuck me, it never ends! Luckily the little shit can't be damaged by enemy fire. If he could, I genuinely don't think I could have beaten this shit. Alright, final stretch here. Just a couple more enemies to dispatch and we're golden. Oh, you bastards. Of course the game would throw two more of these jerk-offs right at the end. These cunts take like two minutes to kill, by the way. Alright, now we can finally- Oh, come my fucking dick off! Are you serious? The end of the game is right there! Just, just, ugh, Get on the fucking plane! I swear if they spawn one more enemy, I will shit myself. Oh, thank God. Wow, and an actual ending cutscene this time. How considerate of them. Well, there we go, that is the entire Akari Warriors series. Now, while Akari 3 was certainly the best in the series, I have to assume it didn't perform gangbusters like the original title did, and SNK never did another follow-up. But at this point, good. I don't think I could physically or emotionally put up with another one of these. But as we all know, the series ending did not spell the end for Ralph Jones and his buddy Clark still. As SNK saved them from eternal obscurity to include them in their hot new crossover title, The King of Fighters 94. With updated redesigns to move them away from the generic Rambo look, Ralph and Clark were teamed up with a new character, their commander, Hyder. With this, the duo was given a completely new identity, and as KOF titles would go on, their lore would be built on, their movesets would become more distinct, and they would even welcome new, original characters into their ranks, like Leona and Whip. The Akari Warriors would go on to become staple characters in the King of Fighters series, with Ralph and Clark themselves being part of the ever-shrinking Cool Kids club of characters that have never missed a single entry. But on top of that accolade, they also get to enjoy always being relevant characters in the story of KOF games. Yeah, they're never the primary focus, but the Akari Troop is always an omnipresent force in KOF's lore. And you can learn all about their exploits throughout the series in another video I might do at some point. Focusing on Ralph and Clark themselves, they began as pretty much carbon copies of each other in KOF 94, sharing the exact same moveset with the exception of their super moves. Over time, they would diverge more and more into their own archetypes with Clark becoming one of KOF's premier grapplers, and Ralph becoming... W well, Ralph. He's part of the big dumb ape archetype. He doesn't so neatly fit into your linear categories, he just punches you and explosions happen. Quantify that, you fucking nerd. They also both took one million steroid for KOF 12 and 13. For Christ's sake, Clark, any more and you're gonna start looking like Clayface. I guess something worth mentioning is that unlike the guests from Fatal Fury and Art of Fighting, the events of the Akari games are never explicitly stated to have happened or are even vaguely reflected on. But that makes enough sense since the games didn't really have very clear-cut narratives anyway. The most we get is one of Ralph's prized possessions being a medal he got from the President, which could be a reference to Akari 3. But either way, it's not really a big deal. Plus, I don't know if I want to live in a world where Victory Road is canonical to King of Fighters. Despite the fact that the original Akari series is dead, 
The characters eventually found refuge in another warfare-based SNK franchise, Metal Slug. Starting with Metal Slug 6 in 2006, Ralph and Clark became regular playable characters in the Run and Gun series, sporting their KOF outfits and even bringing along some of their special moves. Even Leona was later added as a DLC character for Metal Slug XX. Or do you call it to it? Oh, God, fuck it, who cares? With Hydern and Whip showing up in the phone game Metal Slug Defense. So yeah, the Akari troop was sort of given a new lease on life through the Metal Slug games. I wonder if they'll show up in Metal Slug Tactics when it releases on February 31st, 2025. And with that, I think that's about all I have to say. There's a bit of lore to do with Metal Slug and what the Akari Warriors get up to in those games, but those are unfamiliar waters as is, so I think I'll settle for less. Now, do I recommend you play these games? No. If you're anything like me, you'd probably have more fun trying to open a tin of beans with your bell end In public. But you know, I don't want to just put out a blanket statement saying that these games are just shit. I respect their place in SK's history. I can see why they might have been fun 40 years ago. Look, I just really don't want to incur the wrath of people born in the 70s coming to my comment section telling me I'm soft for saying that Victory Road is too hard. You know, the people who leave comments like ABSOLUTE CLASSIC! Kids these days will never know happiness! Underneath footage of the worst fucking arcade game you've ever seen in your life. If you want to experience the whole top-down twin-stick military shooter thing, go play the Hawaii levels from Hotline Miami 2. Or just play Hotline Miami 2 in general. Actually, play both the Hotline Miami games. They go for the price of a quarter pound a meal in Steam sales and are two of the finest video games to ever grace this planet. I'm not fucking around here, you could forget everything I've said up until this point, but if there's anything I want you to take away from the Sakari Warriors video, it's that you should play Hotline Miami. And if you've already played Hotline Miami, you should play it again. As for the future of Akari Warriors, well, I feel like I say this at the end of every bloody video in this series, but I feel like it'd be a good series for SNK to look at reviving, as they've expressed interest in doing so. It's a great cast of characters, and flexible enough to fit in whatever kind of story or environment you want to put them in. I just don't know how easily you'd be able to sell a military shooter in an industry that was absolutely permeated with the things a couple years ago. So I'm not a huge advocate for this, but I would like to still see it happen. Anyway, I have to go pick up the kids. This video's over, I'm sick of it. <laughs>